Now we're going to play a selection from the AIM archives. Uh, I guess I'd like it if you would just tell us about, um, about the world that you were born into and grew up in, your, both your own personal history and the, the general state of things. Well, first of all, I was born on the white earth Ojibwe nation in what is now called northern Minnesota. In our language, it's called Gawa Babe Kanika Ganishinabe in Dana Kiwad, uh, a place called White Earth where the Ojibwe uh, people reside. Anishinabe, Ojibwe, and Dana Kiwad. Um, I'm uh, one of 12 children. Uh, to a disabled uh, veteran, uh, my father, uh, Charles James Belcourt, who was one of 60,000 uh, American Indians to volunteer uh, and go off in the Marines in the First World War uh, fighting uh, fascism in Europe. And my dad was, of course, uh, mortally wounded uh, several times. Uh, fortunately survived uh, and of course uh, was disabled uh, much of his life from uh, the uh, near mortal wounds he suffered in uh, the battlefields of Bella Wood and Argonne Forest. Uh, if anybody knows the history of the uh, First World War, they would know that uh, the Marine Corps uh, fought valiantly there against uh, uh, German imperialism, and of course they were told they were fighting to save their country. And of course, uh, while we honor our men and women who went off and fought in the military on behalf of the United States, uh, I sometimes feel that that patriotism was uh, a false placed, uh, in fact taken advantage of uh, by the United States government in that during that period of time, uh, we were suffering the loss of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of land, uh, perhaps as much as a hundred million acres of land that had previously been reserved uh, in supposedly uh, treaties, legal contractual agreements between supposed uh, honorable people. Uh, while our people always approach it with honor, uh, we feel that the United States government had continuously uh, walked on their own words each and every time before the ink was even dry on the paper. And of course, I'm referring to the many treaties that were made between sovereign, uh, indigenous, colonized nations and the United States government. So my father was one of 60,000 American Indians who volunteered. They didn't have to be drafted. Uh, they were told, you're going off to fight and save your country. And of course, I just explained how a massive amount of our country had been stolen uh, during that period of time while our men were off fighting uh, the war. I say men because at that time it was pretty much unheard of for women to go into the military. That happened much later in the Second World War. And one of the matriarchs of our family, my older sister Maxine, was one of the first uh, American Indian women who served in the uh, Women Army Corps. They called them the WAX. I remember as a small child, I recall her coming home in her uniform. But, um, but getting back to White Earth, uh, I say that because while White Earth uh, had been established for the Ojibwe people by treaty. Uh, uh, 837,000 square acres, uh, which would mean uh, uh, 36 by 36 square miles, that beginning uh, almost immediately after the treaty was signed, um, uh, and to the present perhaps uh, more than two-thirds of uh, all the reserved lands across the country affecting all nations, indigenous nations, uh, had been violated and almost uh, uh, 100 million of the 160 million acres of land that had been reserved across the country for 
all of our nations had been stolen. The same was true at White Earth. So uh, as a child, I grew up, uh, uh, as I recall, uh, I, I experienced racism at a very early age because obviously with uh, so much of our land, perhaps 90% of it at White Earth would, had been stolen through different uh, conspiracies between the state of Minnesota, uh, county governments, and of course the very large corporations who wanted our uh, resources, particularly timber and grazing land resources, um, uh, had been exploited, not to the benefit of our people, who for the most part, uh, most remained in, locked into chronic cycles of poverty, uh, which oftentimes, and in fact, breeds uh, despair, uh, frustration, uh, leads to many times chemical dependency, uh, battered families, uh, broken homes, shattered dreams, and no hope for the future. So that was kind of the uh, environment in which uh, many of us of my generation uh, grew up in. And we, in fact, were the vital link to the past generation that experienced the same type of abuse in the late 1800s, particularly my mother and father and uh, other of the elders on the reservation, on the Ojibwe Nation, who I had a great opportunity to have a chance to, uh, uh, to talk to and to learn much of the oral history of our nation uh, called uh, White Earth. So um, uh, I was born into uh, a, a, a great generation, uh, having had the uh, privilege of being knowing the older generation of the past century. Uh, I learned so much as a child, uh, but one of the things I experienced almost immediately as the settlers, and on White Earth it was primarily uh, Germans uh, leaving their countries of their origin and coming uh, to Minnesota. Many of the uh, German immigrants came in and literally began to steal land in a conspiracy with the state of Minnesota and the counties of Becker. Clearwater and Monoman County, who still encroach into our sovereign territories. Uh, so at a very early age, I experienced uh, racism by the, the non-Indian, uh, primarily Caucasian American merchants, uh, educators, teachers in the school systems, whether it was a public school or whether it was a parochial school, I experienced very early on uh, um, insensitivity on the part of teachers, both within the Catholic Church and within the public uh, school system. So at a very early age, I experienced that sort of racism. Um, I didn't know what it was at first, and then later on I began to figure it out that it was part of a condition of a people coming from all over the world, settling in and among on Indian land, and they themselves uh, denying their own culture, their own history, their own tradition, their own values, language, music, art, that almost immediately American immigrants coming to this country began to inflict on themselves cultural uh, genocide. And, and I think the problem today is still the same in that a people that don't know themselves we're totally incapable of understanding the beautiful tradition, music, art, culture of those people whose lands they were occupying. Coupled with the fact that we were a reminder to them that they were living on stolen land. And the best defense for them is to get offensive, uh, both in word and deed. And so many of our people were the victims of physical abu abuse. Uh, mental abuse, psychological abuse um, by these uh, settlers who came and lived among us, settled on our land illegally. So uh, uh, very early on in school, I sensed uh, the teachers were not very interested in helping the Indian students and would oftentimes pass right by us to go to the white students and to help them 
uh, with their uh, schoolwork or whatever problems they may have. Uh, but uh, in spite of that, and uh, coming out of a condition of poverty, my father being a disabled American Indian veteran uh, on a fixed uh, pension, um, it was difficult sometimes to make ends meet. But my mother, uh, who brought 12 children into the world, uh, and of course there were probably always six or seven or eight of us at home, I recall my mother, uh, uh, she would bake bread and cinnamon rolls every other day. And the day she wasn't baking, on a wood stove incidentally, which is, today most women wouldn't know how to do that. Uh, and the day that she wasn't baking bread and cinnamon rolls and cookies, uh, that was the day she would wash clothes. So in spite of the fact that we had so little uh, materialistic things that she always kept a very immaculate home. I remember that she would be on the floor with a scrub brush and uh, perhaps some type of uh, Hylex or something in the water and uh, eventually after the wood floor being scrubbed so many times it actually turned almost a very light, uh, light tan color uh, but very clean. So while we didn't have no electricity or running water, it was unheard of in those days, um, uh, we all had to use an outhouse. And there's a lot of humorous stories uh, surrounding the outhouse. Perhaps we can talk about another time. But, uh, um, and you know, when you're in Minnesota, northern Minnesota, and it's 35 below zero, you get to understand how uh, people enjoy indoor plumbing today when you had to go out in 30 below weather and sit on that cold wood. Uh, but again, there's a lot of funny stories about that. But uh, coming out of that type of uh, home environment, uh, my mother worked very hard. And as I reflect back now that we've lost her and she's gone into the spirit world as had my father passed on uh, from the injury he suffered in the First World War, um, uh, we had a happy life also. And for the most part, it was a happy life. Uh, uh, as children, we would uh, uh, go fishing and, uh, uh, and camping out on the lake and fish all night. And then in the morning, we would bring the fish home. And uh, what we didn't need for our family, we would take to the elders in the community who would insist on giving us a nickel or a dime per fish, which we would then would use it to buy candy and ice cream, etc. at the store. Ordinarily, we couldn't afford that. but. Uh, uh, the uh, elders would, uh, would always see to it, they gave us a little bit for, for the fish. So uh, we had a good life. Uh, we had a large garden. I think today that if people had to plant their own garden and grow their own food, most of them would starve to death. Uh, there was a saying among the uh, Indian people that if you didn't put seed in the ground in the spring, you didn't deserve to eat in the fall. And I think that's a pretty good rule because we had a large garden we always had the responsibility of weeding the garden, cultivating, hoeing the garden, but we enjoyed the, uh, the fruits of our labor, so to speak, and uh, the fresh vegetables. And I always remember uh, when the garden would come in and my father would bring home uh, uh, several pounds of short ribs of beef. And you could, it was very cheap in those days. I mean, now you have to pay more for that than sirloin steak. But um, he would bring home short ribs of beef, and my mother would make a big pot of boiled dinner with all the garden fresh vegetables. And she would make uh, hot gingerbread and cold tea. And I remember that when we would be out on the lake swimming, we'd come home very hungry. And we always look forward to, uh, to supper time because it was that time that you could have a third and fourth helpings. That wasn't always the case. If there were um, eight or nine hamburger patties on the plate, you had one. And uh, so, you know, we didn't starve to death, but uh, uh, my dad always was able to provide uh, for the little additional money he made in addition to his pension. And, uh, and out of that whole experience, of course, and uh, in a future program, we're going to have on our program, which is called Birch Bark Chronicles. We're going to have a chance to uh, visit with one of the founders of the American Indian Movement to give his experiences as a child. 
who happens to be my brother, Nigon Wiwewidan. Uh, his name translates to thunder before the storm. And when the viewers of Birch Bar Chronicles get a chance to hear from Nigon Wiwewidan, thunder before the storm, a.k.a. Clyde Belcourt, they'll know why he has the name Nigon Wiwewidan. But he'll, he'll share his experience as a child and then growing up and becoming one of the founders of the American Indian Movement in 1968. And, uh, and um, most of us uh, continue to function in the leadership capacity of this movement, even though many have uh, fallen by the wayside for whatever reasons, uh, couldn't keep the faith, or uh, maybe got tired, got burnt out. But uh, the nucleus of the movement is still very much active in the current uh, national board of directors in the leadership capacity. But, uh, you know, my childhood was very interesting. Uh, you know, we, we got bused to school, uh, uh, to a public school uh, on the reservation, controlled by the Caucasian American community and educators and faculty and students and, and staff were predominantly non-Indian or Caucasian American. So uh, there were some very trying times having to put up with that at a very early age. I recall uh, for no reason at all my first day in the first grade in a school called Waban on the, uh, uh, it's a community on the White Earth Ojibwe Reservation or Nation. Uh, Waban, uh, I don't know why, but uh, um, the teacher wanted to slap my hand with a ruler, and I guess I called her some kind of name. I can't recall exactly what it was. Uh, it must have been somewhat bad for her because uh, very early on, my first day in school, I had a bar of Life Boy soap stuffed in my mouth. And, you know, you hear the old saying, wash your mouth out with soap. Well, I had that experience in first grade, and it's indelible in my mind. Uh, to this day, obviously, I can't even stand the smell of Life Boy soap. Uh, so whoever owns Life Boy, sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> don't taste too good even today. Uh, but uh, I went through the uh, um, first to the about the seventh grade in various uh, schools. Um, we moved to the community of Minneapolis and St. Paul a couple of times, so I spent some time in elementary school in St. Paul, Minnesota. Eventually moving back, as most of our people do, they migrate back to the uh, reservation, back to the, uh, to the Ojibwe community, and uh, I ended up in the ninth grade at, a, uh, uh, at the same school. I went to probably the seventh and eighth grade to a parochial school and then I ended up at the same school in the ninth grade at Wabin. And again, I uh, experienced all the same racism from the teachers, insensitivity, uh, the uh, Caucasian American students who always uh, would uh, treat the Indian students in a bad way. Um, and if the results of that, of course, is uh, I got pushed out. I didn't say drop out because our children want an education. But I got pushed out because of all the uh, uh, conditions I just described. And so I, I really didn't even graduate from the ninth grade. And so any education I've gotten since then is sort of self-taught. And I guess uh, I can say I gained an education in the University of Life, uh, of hard knocks, so to speak. But, uh, um, I, you know, I often look back and... Uh, had it been a different environment and the teachers been more sensitive toward the needs of the Indian student, uh, who knows, I may have become a bureaucrat in Washington or something like that, uh, or maybe an attorney or something. But um, I'm satisfied with who I am and, uh, and what I've been able to accomplish. And I think it's a, it's a good message for a lot of our young people who are experiencing the same problem today. To give you an example. An average of 85 to 90 percent of our children who start in the first grade, before they get to the, out of high school, they're pushed out. That's staggering. 85 percent of our students that start today in the public school or parochial school system, primarily the public school system 
on the reservations across the country, 85% don't make it, they're pushed out. Of the 15% that graduate from high school and start a two-year degree program or a four-year college program, 85% of them are pushed out which is a national disaster and people should really be concerned about it. And in fact, there's Bob Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, uh, when he was in the Congress, uh, he chaired a committee and he called the Indian education a national disaster, a national disgrace, and that is still that today. So it's a real serious problem. But, uh, you know, when I finally reached the age of 15 years, uh, like so many young people, I left home. I went out into the world and started taking care of myself for the most part. Always going home, of course, to see my family and to spend some time uh, on the White Earth Ojibwe Nation. But uh, uh, there are so many uh, stories we could tell about uh, as a youth. And perhaps sometime on another program, we'll kind of revisit that subject and we can talk more about it. <clears throat> well, I have a couple of questions sparked by what you just have said here, but uh, first I want to make the observation that uh, your comment about the Germans coming over, leaving their country, so maybe we would all be better off if the Europeans had used their energy to make the countries they were born in better <laughs> livable. <laughs> Shut rather up. than rather than fleeing yeah. and coming over to devour what what they found here because uh it seems it seems to me like part of the part of the keynote of our culture is that there's no energy whatsoever putting into put into making the world livable making your you know and, and here in the modern day in Minneapolis and Chicago wherever the real estate prices are going up, neighborhoods are just taken apart, and it all has the effect of uh, no rootedness. But, but anyway, the quest, the couple of questions I had were... I'd like to comment uh, on that. Sure, go right ahead. Uh, point, uh, I wanted to elaborate on it earlier, but... <clears throat> um, you know, the rationale for most people coming to what they call the New World, which wasn't new at all, it had been here inhabited by... Uh, perhaps as many as 16 million uh, members of different 500 and some different indigenous nations in, in the, the, what's called the United States alone, probably as many as 16 million. Some people said perhaps more like 20 million. Um, but another 100 and some million, 200 million in Central and South America indigenous people who are also being decimated uh, because of the same condition. But um, the rationale for uh, most uh, immigrants coming here was to, uh, because of uh, spiritual, cultural uh, persecution, uh, economic persecution, intolerance. Uh, many of them were victimized by different despotic regimes and government systems in the countries of their origins persecuted for their religious belief. And so they, many of them fled and came to the New World. And they found their freedom here. They found their sanctuary. And of course, uh, rather than draw on their own experience and do something different, uh, the oppressors, the people that were oppressed in the countries of their origins, became the oppressors here. And immediately when they seen all this land and timber and resources, out of their insatiable greed, they began to perpetuate the same conditions and worse against the indigenous people of this land. And of course, um, and that continues on today in places like Guatemala and Ecuador and Peru and uh, Colombia. Our Indian people are still being victimized by European uh, settlers. And you're right, you know, for instance, the Irish community in this country, um, many of them fled uh, because of what the Brits were doing to them in Ireland, occupying their country, taking all the resources out of the country, the food and other natural resources, and leaving them to starve. Um, 
they also came over here. Rather than stay over there and continue the fight against uh, England and the Brits, uh, many of them fled and come over here. And of course, coming out of Boston, many of them ended up in the Seventh Cavalry of General George or Colonel George Armstrong Custer and came out and slaughtered Indians. We're very good at it. And, uh, you know, of course, I've had the great honor of speaking at the National Sinn Féin Conference in Dublin, Ireland. I met many of the prominent leaders of the Sinn Féin movement, the, uh, the Irish Republican movement. Uh, many of them are my dear friends. And they know their language. They know their culture. They know their history. So they're much more sensitive toward our cause than the Irish that fled the conditions over there and came over here. And many of them, as I said, became military officers and went out and slaughtered our people. Uh, the others became plantation owners and enslaved Africans. That's why you see a lot among the African community, you still see a lot of names like uh, uh, Irish names, like Sullivan and others like that. So uh, it's, it's true, uh, a people that came here to find freedom almost immediately forgot what they came for, reversed their roles, and they continued to perpetuate the American Holocaust against our people. Good. Should I kind of stay in one place? Is that what you want me to do? Is this okay? We're good. Can I, how much, how much la uh, latitude did I have here? We're good. I'm just getting to show you this so there's room to oh, okay. do all that. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing about the three cameras is it pretty much guarantees we'll have a good shot of any mm -hmm. particular moment. <clears throat> as soon as he's <clears throat> set here, I'm, um, yeah. okay, so I would like to, um, right, so the the Europeans who stayed in Europe and and stayed connected to their culture and land have maybe have more in common or more ability to understand the native people of this continent than than would the people who left their land, left their culture, and sort of came out in a free for all. And well, when you were talking about, um, you know, when I. Uh... I've traveled quite extensively throughout the world in, in my work with the American Indian Movement beginning in 1969. The movement started in 1968 here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, out of the urban Indian community where many people had been relocated into various urban communities, and we can talk about that also another time. But um, I. Uh, uh, I became involved in the movement here in Minneapolis in 1969. And that work has taken me around many parts of the world. And what I found out because of what we just discussed here, that there's a tremendous reservoir of goodwill worldwide toward our cause and toward Indian people. And many times Europeans and other peoples of other parts of the world, uh, because their educational systems or their curriculums, they have a better understanding of who we are than most Americans do. And the reason for that is because they still know who they are. Right. They place great value in their music, art, culture, traditions, uh, values. And so there is a tremendous reservoir of goodwill out there, but it's something that Americans lose immediately when they come here. And again, just to repeat, uh, when they don't know themselves, don't know their own language, don't know their own culture, they tend to be very intolerant toward other people of color and other people of culture. So I wanted to ask a couple of things about what you've already talked about. Um, first, you talked about how the treaty was signed giving a uh, uh, whatever set reservation land uh, to the Ojibwe people, which immediately began to be uh, cut into by the very, basically anybody who thought they could get away with it, right? Exactly. Mike, okay, so, but that is occurring, the, the, the treaty itself 
is essentially a huge session of other land. So my, I guess my question is, stepping back a hundred years before, where did the Ojibwe people live? I guess any comment about just sort of what the social life was and, and, and a little bit about what they gave up signing that first treaty, even though that wasn't the end of giving up. But, you know, what was that uh, initial step of going onto the reservation into the first place? Waban and Nini and Dijnikaz, Aji Jog Indo Dame, Gawa Babi Kanika, Ganishinabe, and Dana Kiwad. What I said was that my real name is Waban and Nini, which translates to Man of Dawn, Daybreak Man, or uh, Well, there are many different interpretations of it. it. It don't mean any just one thing. It means all the conditions that occur in the morning, just uh, while well, the morning star is out just before daybreak and the dew on the grass, the birds singing. But essentially, my name would translate, which is Wabananini, would translate to Man of Dawn. And I also said Aji Jok in Dordaim. I'm a member of the Crane family or Crane clan. And I come from a place called White Earth, where the Ojibwe people live, which is currently in northern Minnesota. It's one of seven Ojibwe nations, distinct uh, sovereign nations in northern Minnesota. Uh, but before that, um, and I'm doing research, of course, now for a book, and so I've been able to get a lot of information. I'm already back to the uh, 1400s, 1500s, and uh, 1600s. Uh, so I've done, I've traced my roots back. And uh, uh, we, the Ojibwe, at one time, the whole nation, that is the Indian, the Ojibwe in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, uh, at least a couple of provinces of Canada. Uh, many of them still live on their ancestral lands, but the headquarters of the Ojibwe Nation was an island in Lake Superior called uh, uh, the Island of the Orange-Breasted Woodpecker. Uh, it's a very long name. I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> but uh, most people would know it today as uh, Madeline Island. And uh, it's one island in what is called the Apostle Islands. And of course, you can also see the Christian influence here. And the 12 islands became the Apostle Islands. That was the Jesuit missionaries and, and French merchants that came down among us, trappers, etc. cetera. And um, um, Madeline Island got its name from uh, uh, the daughter of White Crane. White Crane, who was the son of Neck of the Earth, our great hereditary chief. White Crane uh, had several children, but he had one daughter. Her name was Ikwewese, which translates to traveling woman. She met uh, a man named Michael Kadot, who was the uh, son of John Baptiste Kadot. Uh, John Baptiste Kadot was a French trapper who was the agent for John Jacob Astor, who was a wealthy East Coast industrialist who uh, moved further and further on the frontier, <clears throat> and in our case, to exploit the fur trade, the timber, and the uh, mineral-rich lands uh, in and around the Great Lakes. Uh, so John Jacob Astor was one such thief that came among us, and his agent was John Baptiste Cadat. His son, Michael Godot, uh, uh, started to romance Ikwewese, traveling woman. Um, our great hereditary chief, uh, White Crane, didn't want her to have anything to do with this Frenchman. Uh, he tried to stop them, but she ran off with him and married him in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, the settlers who already were starting to occupy our lands, the headquarters of the Ojibwe, nation was La Pointe, Wisconsin, on what is now Madeline Island. And already the East Coast settlers from Virginia and other states started to come in and steal land on the islands for their summer home. 
They wanted to call uh, uh, the island of the uh, uh, orange-breasted woodpecker, they wanted to call it Virginia Island. But uh, White Crane uh, decreed that the island would be named after his daughter, who by then had gotten a Christian name, Mary Madeline. And of course, uh, that is why the island today is called Madeline Island. So that's where the, uh, one of the last headquarters of the Ojibwe nation, and then because they come in and wanted to steal all of this land and resources and timber, uh, they dispersed us. We were scattered uh, across several states, as I named earlier, and that's how we eventually arrived in northern Minnesota. So really, Madeline Island still belongs to the Ojibwe Nation. And of course, uh, I'm in the process of writing a book about that whole history, both on my mother's side, going back to the great chiefs of the Ojibwe Nation, but as well on my father's side, the Belle Corps, which is a French name. And uh, my ancestors originated from the Normandy area of, uh, of France. And uh, that's, that'll be another whole story and discussion there. But uh, we got scattered to many different reserves in Wisconsin, Michigan, Montana, uh, North Dakota, uh, Ontario, uh, probably parts of Manitoba. So our, the Ojibwe nation was really scattered. We still are one of the largest nations to have survived the American Holocaust. So having both native and <coughs> French ancestry, you, like, like I would think many people, native people, uh, literally hold all of this within, within you, all the elements of what, of, <laughs> you have roots that go back in two directions. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's a very, it's going to be a very interesting book. Um, it's such a massive project. Uh, to try to trace, uh, to uh, give an accounting of my roots on my mother's side of the family, which goes directly back to Neck of the Earth, White Crane, Equewase, Traveling Woman, uh, Mary Madeline, uh, all of that. And in that period of time, in the 1700s, um, a man by the name of Lyman Warren, whose father got off the Mayflower, um, or maybe it was his grandfather, uh, got off the Mayflower. His name was William Warren, uh, who got on the Mayflower, I think, in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, so on that side of the family, the Warrens also married in uh, to our family. And so I, I guess I can say I trace roots back to the Mayflower and to England and Scotland. But And my mother used to always say that we're part Scottish and, of course, uh, we're part French. Um, but predominantly of the blood, Indian blood, it prevails, uh, Ojibwe blood. But uh, it's, that itself is a very interesting story, the interrelationship between the Ojibwe people and the French missionaries, merchants, trappers, uh, the industrialists like John Jacob Astor who came in and exploited uh, the resources. And then on my father's side, uh, my ancestry comes from the Normandy area of France. And um, when they arrived here, uh, Jules Trottier was the first of my relatives to arrive at Three Rivers in, uh, in Quebec where a lot of the French would come in to the Three Rivers area, then they would scatter across Canada and, and of course, what is now called the United States. Uh, but for some reason, at that time, it was customary for when the elder would pass on, the children would all take different names. In my research, I haven't found out yet why, whether they were trying to cut ties to the old country of France or what it was. Uh, but they would change names, and uh, of um, eight children, daughters and sons, I think there were four daughters and four sons, uh, one or two of them um, took the name Belcor in some form or another. Uh, some would have spelt it B-E-L-E-C-O-U-R, 
uh, some spelt it Belcourt or D. Belcourt. They had the French uh, version of it. And one name that stands out is, uh, he was a Jesuit priest. His name was Father George Belcourt. That name, incidentally, is very prominent yet in Canadian history and the Red River Valley history up around Pembina, North Dakota, and Manitoba and Minnesota, that area of the Red River Valley where the French uh, trappers and merchants came down in ox carts to what is now called uh, Coldwater Springs in St. Paul and Minneapolis, which is a very historic place by Fort Snelling. So uh, Father George Belcourt found himself <clears throat> the chaplain in the provisional revolutionary government of Louis Riel. Uh, Louis Riel uh, was characterized by the authorities in Canada <clears throat> as a half-breed Indian that went off to London and got an education and came back with uppity ways. And his uppity ways was he could see the terrible treatment that Ottawa was giving and the provinces were giving to the uh, both the Crees and the other tribes but primarily the Cree nation and the Métis which by then was the uh, children of, uh, of relationships between the Cree and the French trappers so they referred to themselves as Métis I guess in the southwest it's Mestizo this is the French version of Métis. And they were all being persecuted by the dominant white government of Canada. And Louis Riel uh, could see the great disparity uh, and the mistreatment of the people. So he, the, he created the Provisional Revolutionary Government. That's what they called it. The Provisional Revolutionary Government of Louis Riel. And he began to work with the chiefs of the Cree nation. And uh, his father first made an effort of that effort at that in the, in, the, in the 1860s. Later on in 1880, Louis Riel made a, the son made a second effort, and um, the uh, rebellion was put down by Ottawa, and uh, Louis Riel and 11 Cree chiefs were hung. Uh, in a mass hanging in, uh, in up in, uh, I believe, Saskatchewan and, uh, or Alberta, but it's one of the western provinces of Canada. And so they put down that uh, rebellion uh, by hanging Louis Riel and uh, Father George Belcourt, who would have been a relative, uh, because of the power of the church, was spared the, 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 the gallows, and uh, he eventually started several churches up in the Pembina, uh, North Dakota, uh, Manitoba, Minnesota area, Red River Valley. And uh, he, his name is very prominent uh, in Canadian history, as is the name Belcor in different forms. So uh, what I'm trying to do in this book is to, is to trace my roots from France, from the great chiefs of the Ojibwe Nation on my mother's side, and all the inner relationships, the Warrens coming off the May uh, Mayflower, marrying into our, our f family, uh, uh, Michael Cadot, the uh, Great Lakes Trade uh, Trading Company, American Trading Company, uh, and how all that relates to the present struggle of the American Indian movement. So you see, in looking at our clans coming from the Crane clan, uh, the cranes, along with the loons, were, were really sort of the, uh, uh, the loons were more of a romantic clan. There were the artists and uh, the musicians and the poets. Um, they had those kinds of artistic qualities. The cranes were the ones that were delegated with the responsibility of leadership. They were the chiefs of their clans, along with the women who were the clan mothers. Um, they were always seen as the leaders, the strong leaders. And of course, when you look at, on my father's side, the family, I come from revolutionary stock of the Louis Riel rebellion. So if people would say, well, how is it that you are involved in the American Indian movement today? It's in my genes. It's in my nature. It's in our character. So 
Uh, it's going to be a very interesting book because it'll be like, that'll be book one and then book two will be uh, our struggle in the movement and growing up and, and uh, eventually becoming involved as we are today in, in the American Indian movement. Very interesting history. Has to be told. Well, so just now you, you mentioned the power of the church in uh, helping Father Belcourt escape the gallows. Um, my other question about White Earth when you were growing up was about the, um, oh, so the mix of traditional spirituality, the presence of the church. I noticed a few years ago, uh, I, I've actually really only, only spent a, a week on the reservation, and that was uh, a few years ago uh, recording you. And I won't even mention the name of the reservation, but a couple of things I noticed just in passing through there were that uh, there was a Catholic mission right on the reservation, that there seemed to be uh, sort of a Catholic faction to the community, and they seemed to have high-paying jobs at the casino and, and new cars and <laughs> a certain level of uh, affluence, and that, that the... Uh, traditional people I met and the AIM people didn't necessarily share in the local community there. So um, I guess my question is, when you were growing up, did people speak uh, native language? Were the ceremonies carried out? Was, was traditional spirituality, did it have a prominent place? And what was the place of the Catholics or the, the dominant culture you know, in life at that time? Well, first of all, um, when you look at the role of the church, uh, overall, uh, it was very detrimental uh, to the culture of the uh, Ojibwe people, as was the case with many different uh, other indigenous nations across the country. Um, when the reservations were established, uh, there were grants of land given to different denominations. And their role and purpose was to Christianize what they thought were the savage pagan Indian people, uh, to Christianize them in one form or another. So on this side of the reservation, a piece of land was given to the Episcopalians. Over here, a piece of land was given. Now we're talking about the government giving our land away to the church, to, to the Methodist. Over here maybe was a Mormon enclave. And over here on White Earth, it was the uh, St. Benedictine uh, order of the Catholic Church that had also established a, a, a mission school for uh, Indian girls. And um, that eventually became a parochial school for some years after they shut down the mission school for girls. But through their whole experience, their, their purpose was to uh, demean, degrade, um, discount our traditional spiritual way of life. So growing up as children, most of us, even though our parents did not really go to church, any of them, any of the churches, some did, some didn't, uh, they always felt it was important for us to have some of that influence. And of course, at that time, I suppose uh, they thought it was the right thing to do, but obviously it was not. Uh, because the church played a big role in discrediting our medicine people, our spiritual leaders, our holy men, holy women, if I could call them that, and uh, discrediting them. And so for a long period of time, uh, and continuing up until the American Indian Movement exploded on the scene in 1968, that American Indian culture was on a fast downturn. Uh, and many, many families no longer spoke their language. Many families, I'm, just, I'm talking about Indians all across the country, uh, many did not know their traditional spiritual ceremonies. Many of the spiritual leaders had passed on <clears throat> and took a lot of these practices and ceremonies and songs and um, sacraments with them. Um, so the spiritual way of life, traditional spiritual way of life, 
with the exception of some small communities where the Indian people maintain uh, their identity, maintain their culture, continue to practice their spiritual way of life, uh, speak their language. Um, there were communities like that, but for the most part, a lot of these teachings had disappeared. <clears throat> it wasn't until 1968 in the community of Minneapolis and St. Paul when several people came together. Uh, they called this urban Indian people, men and women, students, um, people who go on to become political activists such as uh, Dennis Banks, Clyde Belcourt, George Mitchell, Mary Jane Wilson, uh, Pat Ballinger. Uh, I could go on and name dozens of the people who were part of this uh, beginning of this movement in 1968 here in the north side of Minneapolis. Uh, it wasn't until the American Indian Movement exploded on the scene where an explosion of spiritual and cultural awareness took place at the same time. And um, it was through this explosion of spiritual and cultural consciousness about Indian is proud, uh, Indian and proud, uh, uh, that it changed things forever. Um, Fact is, I guess I could share with you at this time and with the viewers uh, something that was said in 1973 following the 71-day uh, standoff at a place called Wounded Knee, where in 1890 um, more than 380 members of the Ogallala Lakota uh, Bigfoot was a prominent chief. His people were cut down with Gatling gun and saber uh, at a place called Wounded Knee in 1890 on Christmas Eve. And that was retribution, of course, for the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and other tribes taking on General George, or Colonel George Custer at the Battle of the Bighorn um, some years before. So the massacre at Wounded Knee was, Wounded Knee was retribution for that great victory. Uh, by this coalition of nations. A man by the name of uh, Killstraight was asked a question by an Indian journalist by the name of Richard LaCourse. During Wounded Knee 1973, uh, journalists from all over the world came to uh, South Dakota to cover this story, which was uh, an international event. Uh, the questions that were always asked was, what is the American Indian Movement and what's going on at Wounded Knee? You've been listening to a selection from the AIM archives.